Operation Storm was the single most decisive battle of the Croatian War for Independence. Launched by the Republic of Croatia in August 1995, it was the largest European land battle since the Second World War. The success of this remarkable military action by Croatia came after four years of brutal fighting. Outnumbered, outgunned, but not outmaneuvered, this tiny new democracy prevailed in a David versus Goliath battle, a moral as well as a military victory by an exceptional people. Storm ended the massive humanitarian disaster and genocide committed by the Serbian army in Chetnik Terrace. It led to the liberation of one-third of Croatian territory seized by the enemy, and it made possible the Dayton Agreement that brought peace to the region. This film documents the events surrounding this extraordinary battle, demonstrating that Croatia, along with its army and generals, deserves commendation from the world community, if not a Nobel Peace Prize. I think it's important as we look back at the Croatian War, I would call it the Croatian War of Independence, 1991 to 1995, uh, to see this as a war, uh, first a war for independence, but as a war of self-defense. Croatia was attacked by the uh, JNA, by the Yugoslav army, uh, and the rebel Serbs who controlled 30% uh, of Croatia's territory in the Krajina and in eastern Slavonia uh, were supported, paid for, and put in position by a, what had become a foreign country, namely Serbia. After the collapse of the Berlin Wall in 1989, the agent states of the Soviet Union sought their independent, separate destinies and self-determination. The countries of Eastern Europe made a relatively peaceful transition to independence. But in the case of the Socialist Federal Republic of Yugoslavia, that was not so. Serbian nationalism and fascism began to strengthen. Their ideology, reflected in the 1986 Memorandum of the Serbian Academy of Science and Arts, promoted the concept of Serbian racial superiority that eventually re-emerged in a campaign of ethnic cleansing by the Serbs. The Memorandum sowed the seeds of Serbian hegemony and aggression by promoting the idea that Serbs were victims, although in fact they were the majority population. In self-pitying prose, reminiscent of Mein Kampf, and with belligerent intent, the memorandum advocated radical political action, giving rise to a new political movement. The media played a key role in promoting the false narrative of Serb endangerment that led to the justification for Serbian aggression. As early as 1990, there were bloody terrorist acts, Serbs, in Croatia put up barricades on public roads, blocked traffic, and ambushed a bus filled with Croatian police officers, killing them all. The first Serbian terrorists were led by so-called Captain Dragan, a Serb with Australian passport. Who were these people? It is well known that the provocateurs were led by Belgrade, in particular the people gathered around Milosevic. The origin of the war in Yugoslavia is rooted in the idea of a greater Serbia. Serbs considered Yugoslavia as only a transitional phase of political development in the creation of a greater Serbian country, and that all other peoples living there were only transitory social groups without rights to an independent country of their own. Formed at the end of World War II, the Socialist Federal Republic of Yugoslavia was an artificial political creation Stretching across an extensive area of Central and Southeastern Europe, Yugoslavia was comprised of six republics, Croatia, Slovenia, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Serbia, Montenegro, Macedonia, and two autonomous regions, Vojvodina and Kosovo. Its 22 million inhabitants fought on opposite sides in the Second World War, carried enormous resentment towards one another, 
practiced different religions, yet were forced to coexist. Yugoslavia rested on three pillars. The first was the authority of Josip Broz Tito as lifelong president. The second was the League of Communists of Yugoslavia, a monolithic party that did not allow for democracy or a multi-party political system. The third was the secret police and the Yugoslav People's Army. In the 1990s, I was a major in the Yugoslav Army. When I analyzed the causes of the war, I recall Serbian rallies, the appearance of the Chetniks under the leadership of Šešel, the Serbian demonstration in Kosovo, Montenegro, and Vojvodina. They called for Serbians to arm themselves. I was wondering against whom would they wage war? Why would they wage war? The world must know that the aggression was started by Serbia. Democratic changes could not come about peacefully. The Serbian political leadership had the support of the armed forces of the Yugoslav People's Army. Since the Croatians had been completely disarmed, they knew the Serbs would not protect them. They did not even consider negotiating. They were certain that the Serbs would take the desired areas of Croatia, and Bosnia, and Herzegovina by military force and proclaim greater Serbia. On 25 June 1991, Croatia and Slovenia proclaimed their independence. Under pressure from the international community, the implementation of this decision was postponed for three months. Exactly three months later, on 25 September 1991, the UN called on member states to implement an embargo on the import of weapons to Slovenia and Croatia. This political move by the UN gave the green light to the Yugoslav People's Army and Serbia to use force against those democratic republics that advocated independence and autonomy, all with the intention of preserving Yugoslavia as an artificial creation of the communist regime. That decision triggered the war in former Yugoslavia. Political responsibility is borne by the international community. In July 1991, the armed forces of Serbia and Montenegro, along with the Chetniks, an extreme right-wing nationalist guerrilla force, viciously attacked the Republic of Croatia. Suddenly, fighting began on the territory of Croatia. Several Croatian villages were attacked by Serbs, which the daily Yugoslav newspaper described as a cleaning operation. There is no military term such as cleaning. Rather, we use terms such as attacking, defending, and occupying. Thus, it becomes obvious that they were referring to the ethnic cleansing of the domestic Croatian population by Serbian terrorists and Chetniks. Roads were blocked, the integrity of Croatia was violated, and the Croatian state was practically paralyzed. The war in the former Yugoslavia was started by the Yugoslav People's Army under the political leadership of Slobodan Milosevic. The war was organized, supported, and conducted from Belgrade, the capital of the Republic of Serbia. The attack on defenses Vukovar and Dubrovnik on the territory of the Republic of Croatia began with an operation called RAM. This military operation had two basic front lines of action. Their goal was to cut the Republic of Croatia in two. The newly formed Republic of Croatia did not have an army, nor were Croatian citizens permitted to legally own weapons to defend their lives and country. The UN imposed arms embargo on the export of weapons had the effect of leaving the unarmed Croatian, Muslim, and Kosovo population at the mercy of the well-armed Serbian aggressor. This fourth largest army in Europe, unimpeded by international objections, was able to conquer territory, terrify civilian populations, and commit vicious crimes, including genocide. At the beginning of the war, NATO alliance officials predicted that if attacked, Croatia would be forced to surrender within two weeks. Thanks to the courage, loyalty, and dedication of the Croatian soldiers, our country was successfully defended under these extremely unfavorable circumstances. 1991 was a critical year for our defenses and for the creation of the modern Republic of Croatia. The final months of 1991 saw the fiercest fighting of the war, culminating in the battle of the military garrisons 
the siege of Dubrovnik, and the Battle of Vukovar. The Serbs initiated a campaign of ethnic cleansing against Croatian civilians, and most non-Serbs were either killed or expelled from occupied territory by early 1993. I went to see Kissinger and asked him to take steps to prevent Serbian aggression against Croatia. He told me, Doctor, you are naive. Europe is not about to prevent this war. You do not have any allies. Your only hope is to develop the ability to defend yourselves. Croatia was forced to defend itself on multiple fronts. It faced exceptionally critical situations from Slavonia to the Dalmatian coast. The defense of the city of Vukovar is symbolic of Croatia's response to aggression. Serbia attacked the city of Vukovar with a force of 80,000 soldiers, 1,600 tanks, and armored personnel carriers, 980 artillery weapons, 350 anti-aircraft guns with 750 rocket launchers. The defense of the city was mounted by only 1,850 lightly armed Croatian volunteers. Over the course of the almost 90-day siege, Vukovar was ripped from the heart of Croatia. This was an heroic struggle, often compared to the Battle of Stalingrad. Clearly, it was a legal, legitimate response to Serbian aggression, an act of self-defense that is an inherent, inalienable right of individual and collective right of states to respond to aggression, as provided by Article 51 of the UN Charter. Indeed, according to Chapter 7 of the UN Charter, a defending state is an active participant with the UN Security Council in a joint legal enterprise to stop aggression and restore peace and security. It was here that the young Croatian state established its reputation for courage and determination in the face of overwhelming enemy force. When Vukovar was totally destroyed, the Serb occupier entered the town and committed mass genocide against Croatian civilians. In response to that horror, Croatia created an army capable of halting Serbian aggression. Serb units suffered huge losses and were unable to advance further into Croatian territory. Enormous crimes were committed against Croats and in Croatia, notably uh, the uh, uh, 87-day siege of Vukovar, the systematic destruction of the city, and then the murder of the patients uh, at the Vukovar hospital and they're being dumped in a mass grave in Ultra. The, the uh, uh, ethnic cleansing of the Croats in the Kraina region um, uh, and many other, the, the shelling of Zagreb, which I witnessed, uh, uh, and, and took place, uh, I mean, the shells landed close to my office. There were many, many uh, crimes committed against Croatia. When the Serbian leadership and the Yugoslav People's Army realized that they could not advance further into Croatian territory as they had planned, they agreed to a ceasefire. The Croatian leadership, due to the great losses they had sustained and their lack of material technical resources, also had an interest in a ceasefire. This resulted in the signing of the Sarajevo Agreement for the deployment of UN peacekeepers. The Cyrus Vance Plan was signed on 2 January 1992. Croatia made the most of this pause in the fighting to establish a professional army to protect against further losses in subsequent warfare. Croatia accepted the Vance Plan permitting the deployment of a 10,000-strong United Nations Protection Force on Croatian territory that had been occupied by the Serbs. UNPERFOR was established in February 1992 as an interim arrangement to create the conditions of peace and security required for the negotiation of an overall settlement of the Yugoslavian crisis. The role of the UN troops was to ensure that territory designated as UN protected areas became and remained demilitarized and that all persons residing in these areas were protected from fear of armed attack. 
The role of UN police monitors was to ensure that local police forces carried out their duties without discriminating against persons of any nationality or abusing any human rights. All of 1993 was marked by intense attacks by the Serbian army from Bekovac, Kanin, and Obovac along the southern Croatian coast. This prevented all normal traffic along the Adriatic Highway, leaving open only a sea route to supply the civilian populations in Dubrovnik and other coastal towns and islands. It took a year before Operation Maslinica reopened the land route. The Serbs had destroyed the main bridge, so Croatia built a pontoon bridge and undertook the construction of a permanent bridge. I didn't know General Gotovina until his arrival as a new commander of the operations zone for the district of Split. He seemed young, energetic, and unworried. We saw before us a young man with new ideas. In taking command from his predecessor, he said, I came to liberate Kanin, and I know how to do it. It was the one statement we least expected, but most desired. I wondered then, how does this commander plan to liberate Kanin? Over the next four or five days of the offensive operations, the Croatian army liberated the outskirts of Zadar, the territory near Obrovac, and the Zemunic airbase. They enabled demining operation to proceed and liberated the village of Škabrna, where Serbs had massacred the entire civilian population. The official cooperation between Croatia and the United States occurred at two levels, militarily and politically. The relationship between the military and intelligence services was excellent. America helped in the training and formation of the Croatian army. American drones were used to collect data. Cooperation at the political level was more complex because of the internal conflicts in the NATO alliance and the contrary interests of some of the European Union countries. By 1994, the U.S. increasingly understood the situation in Croatia and Bosnia and Herzegovina and offered great political support to Croatia, recognizing that Croatia had pursued a policy of adhering to international law. President Tudjman met on at least eight occasions with U.S. President Bill Clinton. British and French diplomatic policy supported the survival of Yugoslavia as a single state or as a set of Serbian states that would emerge out of the occupied parts of Croatia and Bosnia and Herzegovina. After three years of Umpofor's mandate, nothing had been accomplished. The Republic of Croatia decided to end the mission. In a conversation between President Tudjman and U.S. Vice President Al Gore in Copenhagen, it was agreed that U.N. forces would leave Croatian territory. This resolution was an indication of the good relations between America and Croatia. Due to harsh winter conditions and frigid temperatures, Croatian soldiers could not remain on Mount Dinara for an extended period of time. Units of the 4th Guards Brigade, the 114th Brigade, and the Auxiliary 6th Homeland Regiment arrived at prearranged intervals that allowed for no more than three to five day stays. A few elite troops had attempted to stay longer, but they died from exposure. They perished in place. We also had to build wooden houses that were transported by Croatian army helicopters to Mount Dinara so that the soldiers had shelter that would enable them to endure the conditions. Helicopter units from the Zemunic Air Base played a key role in all of the fighting around Mount Dinara. Helicopters flew until midnight picking up wounded soldiers from the combat zone and transporting supplies. Without their support, this would have been an impossible task. Before this, the Croatian Air Force had never performed such a mission. The courage and heroism of these pilots deserves recognition and great praise. The winter 1994 military operation began amidst a great blizzard during which it was difficult to determine the elevation in the deltas. The storm lasted for eight days. The operation did not begin in a classical way with a frontal attack. Instead, units of Croatian special forces were inserted behind the enemy lines. 
the Croatians mounted their attack from the rear. Thus, the Croatians launched the attack using diversionary tactics and then hit from multiple directions, hit and run to the next target, surprised the enemy, and enabled the Croatians to win a solid victory. It took nearly eight months of hard fighting to liberate the area. I was asked if I would fly down to a summit that was taking place between Izabegovic and uh, Tuchman, along with their top officials in Split. It was a, a very critical meeting. Um, they worked out uh, agreements on joint military actions in Bosnia. You know, I was not involved in any of those negotiations directly. But I did talk to, to uh, uh, Miramir Zhuzhel, who uh, was a, uh, at this point, I think the Croatian ambassador to the United States, but a close advisor to Tuchman. And I had suggested to him that the joint declaration include the following language, that the Bosnia-Herzegovina requests the assistance of Croatia in the uh, defense of Bosnia. Uh, and why was that language important? Because it would justify, as a matter of international law, Croatia's direct military involvement in Bosnia. Because uh, under international law, of course, you can't go into a territory of another state unless you're invited. And this, and this was an invitation, and it was an invitation based on the inherent right of self-defense in the UN Charter. Uh, and so that was in the, in the declaration. What was looming ahead was the thing that could bring the war to Bosnia to an end and save Bihać. I, you know, there, there were 160,000 people there, at least 40,000 of whom men and boys were at risk of being massacred. Victorious military operation Flash in Western Slavonia destroyed the entire core of the Serbian army. This victory greatly improved the morale of Croatian soldiers at Dinara. After each lost battle, the Serbian army carried out various reprisals against Croatian civilians in Kanin, Banja Luka, and other places throughout Bosnia and Herzegovina. There were many instances of destruction of churches. In the village of Preznatja, the Serbs killed a Catholic priest and a nun. As a result of that, Bishop Komaritsa went on a hunger strike to protest the atrocities. In the midst of the Croatian military successes, the president of Bosnia and Herzegovina, Elija Izetbegovic, sent a congratulatory message to President Tuchman with an invitation to liberate Sarajevo, which was under siege by the Serbian army. There was growing concern that uh, the Serb plan was to divide Sarajevo, basically cut the inner city off from the airport. This led to a NATO airstrikes, uh, and the Serbs responded by taking UN uh, peacekeepers as hostages, actually, uh, uh, chaining some of them to places that might be bombed. I mean, it was a, a total crime under international law. But the effect of that was to make the UN reluctant to authorize NATO airstrikes and NATO reluctant to undertake them. In fact, there was a secret deal between the UN general and the Serbs that there wouldn't be bombing. And the Serbs then took that as a green light uh, to clean up the map of Bosnia um, and to um, uh, take the safe areas. After the signing of the split agreement between Tuchman and Itza Begovic, a British elite troop unit, suddenly appeared in the area around Tomislavgrad. It was their intention to occupy the area around Mount Dinara in order to stop the advance of Croatian combat troops headed toward Kanin. Fortunately, the British were forced to leave the area. We all thought, nice try. Serbian aggression against Bosnia-Herzegovina was heavily underway. Bosnia and Herzegovina's forces were incapable of mounting a successful defense. Had Croatia's military not come to their aid, all of Bosnia and Herzegovina would have been occupied by the Serb army. The war between the Muslims and the Serbs was harsh. I believe that between 250,000 and 300,000 people died. The war was primitive and bloody. 
at this time of Serbian aggression against Bosnia and Herzegovina, Croatia became a refuge for at least 200,000 Muslims whose lives were saved by Croatians when they were forced to flee their own country ahead of the Serb troops. The Croatian state took them in, and this is also a significant component of the role of Croatia played in the defense of Bosnia and Herzegovina. In 1993, the UN Security Council established six security zones in Bosnia and Herzegovina. These were the areas of Sarajevo, Srebrenica, Zepce, Tuzla, Gorazde, and Bihać. In Bosnia and Herzegovina, the international forces were required to commit themselves to establishing peace with their army and then guaranteeing the security and stability of the area. However, that did not happen. Instead, what occurred was massive genocide in Srebrenica in 1995. I was selected by the Council of Jewish Community Members to rescue the besieged Jewish people from Sarajevo. We should not forget that the greatest assistance in these efforts came directly from Croatian Minister of Defense Gojko Šušak and General Prejak and the Croatian Army. The UN protected area of Srebrenica was penetrated by the Yugoslav People's Army, the Serbian Army, and Chetniks who committed genocide against the Muslim population. More than 8,000 people were killed in two days of slaughtering. Tadoš Mazovetsky, the UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights said, due to the events in Bosnia and Herzegovina in the past few weeks and especially the fact that the United Nation has allowed the fall of Srebrenica and Zipa, along with the terrible tragedy that has struck the people in these safe areas, which were guaranteed by international agreements, I feel obliged to declare that I no longer see the possibility to continue to act as a special correspondent at this time. Some countries, including the United Kingdom, concealed and destroyed evidence of the Serbian massacre of the people in Srebrenica. There's no doubt that the evidence of what had happened in Srebrenica changed the thinking in Washington. The fall of Srebrenica demonstrated the complete helplessness of the international community. The deplorable crime of genocide by Serbs who killed over 8,000 inhabitants in two days was the worst crime in Europe after the Second World War. But Milotic, being Milotic, uh, really uh, a, a criminal, sadistic, cruel individual, wasn't just content with taking Srebrenica. Bihać had been under siege by Serbian military forces for two and a half years. Although Bihać was one of five security zones under the protection of the United Nations, its 150,000 residents, refugees, and displaced persons were exposed to armed attacks, starvation, poisoning attempts, and threats of genocide. It was widely recognized that the danger of genocide on an even larger scale than Srebrenica was likely. The town of Bihać was surrounded by Serbian forces. The first days were difficult and uncertain. There were many wounded. The main stronghold of the Serbs around Bihać was at the Grabska garrison from which the city was bombarded every day and suffered great devastation. Living and surviving 1,201 days encircled and under siege is a difficult life experience that the citizens of Bihać endured during the Homeland and Liberation War. This experience involved daily shelling, killing, fear for life and limb, loss of loved ones, hunger, suffering, destruction of body and soul. We are standing on the front line of the city of Bihać, which was defended by members of the 2nd Croatian squad along a 42 kilometer front. To the right of us is the city water supply, which was destroyed by the Serbs. The city of Bihać was without water. Bihać was on the edge of survival. The aid coming from Croatia was of crucial importance for the survival of Bihać. As mayor of the city of Bihać, I would like to thank President Tuzman and the Croatian Ministry of Defense for their support, without which the citizens in this area and city could not have survived the siege. The territory of Bihać was defended by the 5th Corps of the Army of Bosnia and Herzegovina and by the Croatian Defense Council. 
The Serbs fiercely attacked the area and kept it completely encircled. Even worse would be a situation where the Bosnian Serbs uh, and, the, uh, and the Croatian Serbs take Bihać, and um, what are they going to do if they do that? If they do the same thing in Srebrenica, we're going to see 40,000 men and boys murdered. In 1994, U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations, Madeleine Albright, warned the U.N. Security Council and the entire world that the town of Bihać was under siege by Serbia. We must be grateful to her for her bravery in exposing the situation of civilians who were living under disastrous human conditions. I send urgent appeals for help to political and military authorities in Zagreb and beg them to understand that the situation we faced in Bihać was urgent and extremely serious. I explained that radical measures were needed to be taken to rescue the population of the city and the surrounding area. NATO carried out an air attack on the Serbian airbase Udbina. The head of UNPROFOR, British General Rose, was opposed to the total destruction of Udbina. He warned the Serbs before the NATO attack, giving the Serbs time to remove aircraft from the airfield. Just a few hours after the NATO attack, the base was back in operation and the Serbs continued their airstrikes against the Croatian population. General Rose was opposed to strengthening the NATO attacks on the Serbs. In response to the attacks, the Serbs closed all of the checkpoints to the civilian traffic, stopped flights to the Sarajevo airport, captured French, Canadian, and Ukrainian soldiers who became hostages, and used them as human shields to deter future possible NATO air raids. It is well known that in several instances, British and French pilots promptly informed the Serbs about their preemptive strikes. Moreover, they dropped their bomb loads in the Adriatic Sea, not on the designated targets. Only American pilots performed their assigned missions properly. One American pilot was shot down and captured by the Serbs, but he was rescued and saved thanks to Croatian special forces. The international community was not prepared for the military action. It was already resigned to the fall of Bihać and accepting the Serbian occupation of 80% of the territory of Bosnia and Herzegovina. Lord Owen, chairman of the contact group that moderated the crisis, spoke to Croatian and Bosnian representatives. He stated, don't expect to gain through diplomacy what you haven't been able to achieve militarily. General Gotovina came to my office and said, Raiko, prepare a map for me. Make a plan to take the Croatian military force towards Glamoc. I looked at him and told him, General, I can do that, but I'm a professional soldier and I have never seen a single military operation in the history of warfare attack an enemy with your own forces divided. One part of the army going west, the other east. General Gotovina responded, just draw it, Raiko. It will be fine. I replied, General, if that will work, you will be inducted into History of Warfare Hall of Fame. And he was. President Franjo Tudjman and Alia Izebegovic signed a declaration for the implementation of the Treaty of Washington. The most important part of their meeting was an agreement on their military cooperation. Based on this agreement, the Croatian forces launched Operation Summer 1995. The aim of the operation was to break the power of the Serbian army and Chetniks in the area of Livno, Grohovo, and Glamoc, and stop the Serbian attacks in the Bihać safe zone. With Operation Summer 1995, the conditions for the second military phase were created. The second phase would be Operation Storm. The moment that the Croatian army was victorious at Mount Dinara in the hinterlands of Kanin, it became clear to the Serbs that they could no longer hold the town of Kanin under occupation. Under the circumstances, Milosevic ordered the Serb leaders to prepare for a retreat from Kanin and to take with them the entire Serbian population. According to a CIA report, the Army of the Republic of Croatia in 1995 was not the same army as it had been in 1991. It used the four years of its existence to create a professional army of 75,000 members classified into eight brigades with a broad component of another 140,000 members of the National Guard. 
General Gotovina came to a meeting on Briuni and placed a map in front of President Tujman and the generals. The meeting was one of heated debate over whether there was sufficient power to liberate Kanin. Gotovina was confident that his units were ready because they had been successfully waging war on the battlefield for eight months and winning every battle. Gotovina told President Tujman, My soldiers cannot wait any longer. They see Kanin in front of them. We are ready to attack, but we need your command to do so. President Tujman stood beside Gotovina, placed his hand on the map, and said, Here it is. All of you do as Gotovina recommends. I got a message, the message I wanted, which was to tell Tujman that uh, the United States um, effectively did not object. Uh, and I went down and I saw him in Brioni. My message was, um, said, we appreciate your willingness to uh, spend treasure and blood to relieve the siege of Bihach. We want to warn you that if things don't go well, you, uh, don't ask us to, to help you out. You're going to be on your own. Uh, and it included, as I had recommended, uh, you know, uh, important warnings that you have to protect the civilian population, uh, be concerned about human rights, and make sure you don't uh, harm the UN personnel. Of course, uh, uh, Tujman understood this very clearly, uh, although I said this is not a green light, and he said, yes, yes, I understand it's not a green light, but of course it was a green light, and I knew it, and, and people in Washington knew it. President Tuchman's position was clear. The Croatian army was not going to quietly stand by as the Serbs and Chetniks engaged in aggression against Bosnia and Herzegovina, while Umprafor turned their backs. The international community had the responsibility to prevent the escalation of conflicts, a new tragedy, and more refugees. Croatia was at that time providing safe haven to 600,000 refugees from Bosnia and Herzegovina. On July 21st, I went down to Brioni uh, at the invitation of President Tuchman to join him for dinner with uh, President Demerol of Turkey. Uh, and uh, at the end of the dinner, Defense Minister Goyko Shushak uh, pulled me aside to say that President uh, 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 Tuchman had decided on military action to through the Kraina to relieve the siege of Bihać. On 4 August 1995, the Croatian army began Operation Storm, a large-scale military offensive in areas occupied by the Serbs. Operation Storm was set out in four separate parts, designated Storm 1 through 4, which were allocated to various corps based upon their individual areas of responsibility. Croatia launched its 130,000-strong army. Each plan was scheduled to take between four and five days. Lieutenant General Ante Gotovina was assigned the Storm 4 plan, which was the primary component of Operation Storm. It included Mount Dinara, the toughest territory from which to engage the enemy. The 30,000-strong split corps was under Gotovina's command. The 3,100-strong special forces deployed to the Velebit Mountain was commanded by Lieutenant General Mladen Markic. The 25,000-strong Croatian Army Gospic Corps assigned the Storm Three component of the operation was commanded by Brigadier Mirko Nurac. The Croatian Army Karlovac Corps composed of 15,000 troops commanded by Major General Miljenko Cernyac executed the Storm II plan. The Croatian Army Zagreb Corps of 30,000 troops assigned the Storm I plan was commanded by Major General Ivan Bazarets. The Croatian Army Bielovar Corps was commanded by Major General Luka Janko. On 4 August, coordinated attacks were executed by the Croatian Air Force with strikes aimed at disrupting Serbian Army command, control, and communications. UN peacekeepers were notified three hours in advance of the attack by Tuchman's chief of staff. Operation Storm was a strategic victory in the Bosnian War, effectively ending 
the Serbian siege of Bihać and placing the Croatian Army, Croatian Defense Council, and the Army of Bosnia and Herzegovina in a position to change the military balance of power in Bosnia and Herzegovina. The Croatians quickly occupied Kanin, the Serbian administrative headquarters. In anticipation of the Croatian takeover, Milosevic ordered that in the event of Croatian military action, the civilian population should leave and head to Serbia. Close to 200,000 Serbs followed his directive. Serbian political leaders felt that a mass exodus of civilians could be described as a sign of violation of international law. Operation Storm had a tremendous impact on the war in Bosnia, especially when the city of Bihać was liberated and the Serbian army was defeated. An exhausted, traumatized, and famished 150,000 people in the city of Bihać welcomed their Croatian liberators. Storm was the last major battle of the Croatian War of Independence and a major factor in the outcome of the Bosnian War. It was a decisive victory for the Croatian army, which attacked across a 390-mile front against the Serbian army. The battle was launched to restore Croatian control of 4,000 square miles of their own territory, representing 18.4% of Croatia. Operation Storm began at dawn on 4 August 1995 and was declared complete on the evening of 7 August. The operation itself followed an unsuccessful United Nations peacekeeping mission in diplomatic effort to settle the conflict. Operation Storm was well planned. Moving tanks over the Dinara mountain chain and their descent into the city of Kanin represents the height of the art of modern warfare. Nowhere in battle at any point in military history have tanks emerged from a direction from which they were not expected as occurred here. Operation Storm is currently being studied at military academies around the world, including the prestigious West Point. As U.S. General James Mattis told the Croatian Minister of Defense at the Pentagon in 2018, Storm is an operation that is studied in the U.S. military to show what a well-led, well-trained force with good political guidance, how it can change the course of history. We have great respect for our friend and ally. Croatia is a small country, but as we say, it bats above its weight, fights above its weight. The front line of Operation Storm was 397 miles long. It covered 425 square miles of occupied Croatian territory. The area was completely liberated by the Croatian army in four days. There were two fundamental military goals. One was to reach the Kanin Fortress and the other was to liberate the city of Bihać. Both were accomplished in record time. Storm should not simply be seen as a military operation that liberated most of Croatia, but also as an operation that had a humanitarian character. Since it saved the inhabitants of Bihać from almost certain genocide, the operation allowed the international community to save its honor after the disasters of Srebrenica and Priedo, when the UN forces stood by as thousands of civilians were massacred. Who knows what the fate of Bihać and the surrounding cities would have been had we not been rescued by the Croatian state and the Croatian army. There would probably have been a humanitarian catastrophe with countless victims. Thanks to Operation Storm and the three battles that followed it, the Serbian army was defeated and the conditions for the peace process to begin were finally established. The Dayton Agreement signed in the U.S. and confirmed in Paris was the result of a peace negotiation that ended the war. Unfortunately, one of the conditions of the Dayton Agreement was to turn over 49% of Bosnian territory to the Serbs. Operation Storm was the turning point in the uh, wars of the former Yugoslavia. Turning point both for the Croatia War, which had begun in 1991, and for the war in Bosnia. It represented a, a, a decisive defeat 
uh, for the Serbian side in the conflict, the, co the side that initiated it. Uh, and as a result, it uh, led within a few months to the two peace agreements that ended the war, that is to say the Erdut Agreement, uh, which uh, uh, ended the war in Croatia and brought about the peaceful reintegration of the last bit of Serb-held territory uh, in eastern Slavonia, including Vukovar, and it led to the Dayton Peace Agreements, um, which um, ended the war in Bosnia. The value of the Dayton Agreement was that the killing and the terrible war were stopped. Operation Storm defeated the Serbian army. Storm liberated Western Bosnia and Herzegovina. Unfortunately, however, Republic of Serbia was created by the Dayton Agreement. This republic was built on ethnic cleansing, terrible war crimes, and criminals convicted by the International Hague Tribunal. Unfortunately, by the Dayton Agreement, Bosnia and Herzegovina was divided, giving 51% of the territory to Bosnian Muslims and Croatians, and 49% of the territory to Bosnian Serbs. For all the criticism, I think, that has been made of Dayton, it was never intended as a roadmap for uh, the organization of a country. It was intended as a means of ending a war. And measured by that standard, uh, it has been a success. After the Dayton Agreement, 100,000 Serbs voluntarily left Sarajevo. 27,000 left Croatia, escorted by the American ambassador, and between 50,000 and 80,000 left the eastern part of Croatia when they realized that these areas would not become part of greater Serbia. I am sorry that we did not liberate Banja Luka. Splitting Bosnia and Herzegovina in half created an unresolvable political crisis. That is why we now have a power struggle with no possibility of agreement. A, a defeat in Banja Luka would be a decisive defeat of, the, of a fascist Bosnian Serb regime that had engaged in genocide and mass murder. In short, there would be no Dayton, there would be no division of Bosnia, there would be the decisive defeat of the murderous and fascist side. Um, and it was, a, it was a difficult call. Um, and in the end, uh, because it was a difficult call, uh, Holbrook and I agreed that we would stay with the instructions we had, and so we went and told Tujman um, not to go ahead, not to take Banja Luka. Uh, and for years later, and even to this day, I wonder whether that was the right decision. This was a war in which Croatian Jews suffered alongside Croatian people as a result of Serbian aggression. The Jewish community in Croatia was placed under the protection of the entire Croatian political leadership by President Franjo Tuđman and Defense Minister Gojko Šušak. Throughout the war, Croatian people showed great concern for the Jewish people, which is evident from the fact that the Croatian state offered all Jews from Bosnia and Herzegovina Croatian citizenship. This meant that every one of us who came to Croatia was welcomed. This gave our Jewish community great faith in the Croatian state. Croatia and this war can be very proud of its treatment of the Jewish people. I was a humanitarian advisor to Tujman government. Tujman showed an extraordinary degree of intelligence and care. He appointed Hebron as health minister, Granic as minister for refugees and displaced persons, and Kosolic as minister for prisoners of war and missing persons. No government in history has taken such proactive measures to address these concerns. If we wrote a book about the humanitarian dimension of modern warfare in 1996, no one in Croatia would have been charged with war crimes. Croatia would have been at the center of the world's attention for doing good. The Hague Tribunal focused their accusations on General Gotovina, who symbolized the new Croatian army. Built to Western standards, efficient, disciplined, proactive, the Croatian army was victorious over the Yugoslav army in all combat operations. The Hague Tribunal appeared to use General Gotovina as a means to condemn the newly independent Croatian state. As a reward for saving 150,000 people in Biatch, for bringing peace to Bosnia and Herzegovina, for ending the war, world powers brought charges against Croatian generals 
Ante Gotobina and Mladen Markac, falsely accusing them of war crimes. Initially, the verdict of the Hague Tribunal was a lengthy sentence. This is the only case in human history in which people who defend their homes, save others, end violent occupations, fight against terrorists, and bring about conditions for a peaceful resolution of a conflict are punished for it. Thank goodness that outrageous verdict was overturned in 2015 and our generals were fully exonerated. In February 2015, at the conclusion of the Croatia-Serbia genocide case, the International Court of Justice in The Hague dismissed a Serbian lawsuit which alleged that Operation Storm constituted genocide, ruling that Croatia did not have the specific intent to exterminate the country's Serb minority. The court also found that the Croatian army left accessible escape routes for Serbian civilians. Gojko Šušak, Minister of Defense of the Republic of Croatia, received recognition from the international Jewish organization JOIN. Generals Prayak, Gotovina, and Tuta played an enormous role in the protection of Jews. It is a historical truth that needs to be repeated thousands of times because the Croatian people have shown that when they have their own state, the government has adopted very high standards in relation to minorities and respecting human rights. Operation Storm was a world-class military operation. It is important to say that the idea of preventing the war crime of genocide came from Croatia. Thanks to this, there is a permanent counselor for the prevention of genocide at the United Nations today. Conceptually and practically, this idea came from the Croatian military defense strategy of President Franjo Tuđman, who was the first to apply the principle of anticipating and confronting genocidal threat in the world. This Croatian contribution to the security of the world is amazing. Operation Storm, the largest European land battle since World War II, was the crown jewel of the Croatian homeland war. It demonstrated the extraordinary organizational, tactical, and strategic brilliance of the political and military leadership who married science and improvisation. Croatian soldiers and officers showed enormous courage and determination. Their heroic efforts brought Serbia to its knees, which President Bill Clinton felt was a precondition for the Serbs agreeing to come to the peace table. Colonel Andrew Leslie, who commanded the United Nations Confidence Restoration Operation in Croatia in the Kanin area, assessed Operation Storm as a textbook operation that would have scored an a by NATO standards. The Croatians have enormous humility, but they should tell their children of their great victory, their triumph over evil. As President Franjo Tuđman so aptly put it at the completion of Operation Storm, on this day we can say that Croatia stopped burying its historical cross. This is not simply about the liberation of territory, but the creation of a foundation for a free and independent Croatia for centuries to come. From this day to the ending of the world, Croatian soldiers shall be remembered. This noble few, this band of brothers, 